Hey everyone, Carrie Beck here for, from familyebiz.com. Can't seem to talk right now. Hey, we are talking about emails. And one of the reasons is Family eBiz is all about helping you gain flexibility and freedom in your life by building and scaling and growing your online business. All of you that are dreaming of doing that. And email marketing is probably the most important tool that I use on a regular basis. Usually daily is email marketing. It is my number one tool. I talked about that several weeks ago. Um, we are continuing on there. We've already talked about what to do in the first email. We've talked about mistakes you need to avoid. So let's talk about follow-up. I've mentioned fortune is in the follow-up. You have got to follow up with them. If you plan to just send one email a month or two emails a month, they're going to forget who you are. So you have got to have some sort of follow-up series. And we're going to talk a lot about that welcome one. What do you include in that first series? And I've got six steps to help you write the perfect email series. And you really need to hit the bullseye on every one of these because you want to grow trust with your subscriber. They know who you are. Do they like you? Do they trust you? I don't know. But these six steps will help you be able to craft emails that can help them to build trust as well. You want them to remember you and have that rush of pleasure when they see your name in their inbox and to feel like they're getting real email instead of just a whole bunch of marketing messages. Now, uh, there are some people that are better. There are lots of people better than me, but um, we really want to, I think when you are transparent and honest and open and you use real stories that they can relate to, that is fantastic. Um, now, what I want to do is tell you also, I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, if you need more help on any uh, anything with email marketing, we have an ebook called Email Writing Secrets, and there is a link wherever you're listening to that you can grab that. Also, if you have not subscribed to our channel, would you please click subscribe? Let us know, uh, comment what's your biggest takeaway. But if you could subscribe, that would be humongous, and that would be a great favor to me. So what do what are those six steps? Number one. What your subscriber sees in their inbox. So when they receive an email from you, what do they see? What is the, and I'd love to know, what do you think is the number one thing that will get them to open your email? For some of you, you're thinking, oh, it's that subject line. And yet that is not it. The number one item that will get your emails open is your from. Who is it from? And when you say a company, that's not very personal. I put my name on any business email because we are not corporate. Even if you're running a nonprofit or something, they want to know it's from a real person, not a business, not a corporation. Now, if you're um, Walmart, you might be able to get away with that because it is a corporation. But we are small online businesses and it needs to come from a person. And so if you put your name in the from line, they'll know it's not spam. They'll start to remember who you are, not just your company. For me personally, I put Carrie, and I don't even know if I put Beck. I might write Carrie B. And then I start to write familyebiz.com or Carrie B, um, how to homeschool my child. They may not see all of that, but they're going to see my name as a person first and foremost. That is what is going to get your emails open. Second is your subject line. We talked a little bit about that last week. We want to use not a boring subject line, something that causes intrigue and curiosity. Curiosity is not an emotion, but it is strong enough and doubles as one to help you get your emails open if you will build curiosity. You want to grab their attention and stir up that emotion as well. So, um, you want to do that. Your subject line does not need to be original. It can be. It doesn't need to win some literary award. You just want it, you're just using it to get your email open. And then we're going to deal with the inside. Now, if you want to know some ideas about good subject lines, we have an ebook called 37 Best Subject Lines. We're offering it for free now. And you may get it that there'll be a link wherever you are listening to this, and that would be helpful. So what your subscriber sees in their inbox, the from line and the subject line. Number two, what your subscriber sees when she opens your email. What does she see? Congratulations. Yay. She's opened it, but oops, is it worth reading? If your subject line does not relate to that first sentence, there's no reason. I mean, she's going to go, 
this is not it and go on. There are way too many emails. So you have got to make sure that whatever you're talking about in that very first sentence and paragraph is congruent with whatever that subject line is. And so you want to make sure that you are not misleading. That first paragraph and especially the first sentence is used to hook them. So the rest of your email can reel them in, reel them in as in a boat or reel them into your corral of all the other information that you're offering, right? And you might tell a person, I tend to try to start with a personal story of something that's going on with our family or with me, or it just depends on the topic of the email. Or maybe it's a story of something that's happened to me in the past. Whatever it is, it needs to hook them, get their attention, and something they can relate to. So what do they see in their inbox? What do they see when they open it up? Name, number three, name the problem and promise a solution. You do need to be able to name whatever the problem is you're dealing with. Making that person feel extra special. Like, hey, she gets me. I get it. This is great. All right. So I've told stories about Christmas and I've told stories about how I was crying from Steve's Christmas, uh, from his family Christmas to my family Christmas in Houston. I was so overwhelmed. I was crying. I was blaming everyone. The kids in the back seat don't know what's going on. That was a story about me, but my readers are like, oh yes, I get it. That is me. I, it, they may not be crying on Christmas day, but they have been overwhelmed by everything, all the things in the holidays. So that would be um, one way to make them relate to you and then give them a tip, a solution. I go right into the solution that we ended up with. So what do they see um, in their inbox? What do they see inside? What's the problem and solution? And be upfront. Don't be afraid to tell your reader you've got a solution and give them that solution. So be upfront. That's number four. Number five, tell them what to do. Don't beat around the bush. Some of y'all are too afraid to pull the trigger and ask them to click. Ask them to buy something. Ask them to send money. Ask them to do whatever it is. What is the call to action? You have got to tell them. Because if they read it and they're just reading all this stuff, sometimes they get so lost in it, they don't know what to do. They just close it up and go on to the next email. Be very clear about what to do. Don't be cutesy. Maybe if you've been writing for a while, you might be able to be cutesy. I would say most of us, we need to get to the point. Um, and don't just stick in a line uh, that's, uh, don't just stick in a line that says, oh, here, do this. You need to give them some background. Tell them what you want to do, all right? And tell them, hey, Sign up for my free seven-part mini course. Here you go. Click the button and then they can sign up. The other thing you might do is think of ways to inspire your reader to click immediately. You don't want them coming back to your email because let's face it, when they don't do something right then, they're not going to do it. Too often it's going to get back there. So um, we don't want to make the time period of clicking so short, like if you're having a flash sale. You may give them three days, but then send them a reminder on the last day. Don't send one email that says only 50% off for the next three hours. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have someone open it up four hours later, and they're going to be annoyed, and they're going to be angry and upset. They're going to go, this person doesn't give me enough time. I actually had that happen over the holidays. I was looking at um, a special, and I saw it two days ago. So I saw it like the day after New Year's, January 2nd, but it, I couldn't get the discount anymore. And it was only like three or four days earlier, but I wrote them and said, hey, I'm just catching up from the holidays. Is this price available? Because I didn't know if it was a typo. Guess what they did? They were so smart. They sent an email later um, the next day that said, hey, we know some of y'all were so busy traveling in the holidays. We've gotten emails about that. This is price is available only today. Well, I got that one because I'd sort of been looking for a response. So that's a great way to if someone gets cut off and they're getting you're getting emails about, hey, is this special? And you can offer that special again. You don't just offer a special to offer it. You need to give them a reason why is what she did. So tell them what to do and to get them to click immediately by using some sort of urgency or scarcity as well. And then number six, one of my favorite parts of an email, add a PS. Now I will say 
Internet marketers that have been coming around for a while, some of them feel like the PS is an overused device. I don't think so. Statistics and tests uh, show that the PS is the most read part, probably the first sentence and the PS, most read part. Because if they're scrolling down and they get to the bottom and there's a PS, they're going to read it usually. And so how do we use the PS? I would encourage you to use it as a way, maybe a surprise offer, a coupon or a freebie for whatever it is you're talking about. Um, and then that would eventually lead them to a paid product as well. But the PS is there to give your subscriber a last chance, a last prod into clicking. And so I really encourage you, you need a link to click in your PSs as well. So let's go over those six steps real quickly. If you need more help on any of these, go grab a copy of our Email Writing Secrets ebook. We go into detail about much more than just this. But when you're making a series, your follow-up series, Fortune is in the follow-up, we want to pay attention to what do they see in their inbox when they get your email? What do they see when they open up their email? Then tell them the problem and then be upfront with the solution. Tell them exactly what to do. What is that call to action that you want them to do? And make it worthwhile that they would click it right then. And then number six, add a PS with a link. It's one last push to get them to click on you as well. Hey, let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any other suggestions about email marketing. Next week, we will be pulling all of this together and giving some final thoughts and some final strategies that you can use. I am Carrie back with Family eBiz. We'll talk to you later.